Ja, willkommen zurück aus der Pause. Um, hier yes, welcome back after the break. We shall continue on the stage and we will be talking about a program of the yellow tracks, these physical bases or foundation, i.e. we will be hearing from a panel which is going to focus on the topic what is the weight of a bit. We will be as interactive as possible. You will have an opportunity to put your questions. Um, if you want to put a question, make sure you use the microphone um, and the facilitator will pass the floor to you. So go to a microphone, speak into a microphone and you will be picked. The panel will be delivered both in German and English. If you just joined us now, you will be able to get yourselves to avail yourselves of a pair of headsets or earphones. And uh, now let's have a brief primer on the physical basis. Let me just double check. I mean, those of you who uh, speak English don't yet have a translation device. Maybe I can take care of that. Could you briefly go to the pan, uh, go to the info registration de desk and give the two panelists a pair of headsets? I will use this opportunity to tell you what is going to happen. After the 90 minutes, we will have had lots of food for thought, but uh, we will also need some physical thought and provided we've had enough helping hands to prepare lunch. There will be lunch waiting for you outside one floor uh, like on the same floor and one floor above. You also paid for lunch with your ticket. All of this will be sustainable and fair because we want to make our contribution towards a fair sustainable future at this location. In, I would like to invite you for to lunch and and maybe you also want to help us do the dishes afterwards, please go to the info registration desk. Apart from that, um, we are still looking for um, people who record the screens or want to um, operate the camera. If you feel like it, just go to the registration desk um, entitled info. So, by the way, I see a few empty bottles over there. Just feel at home here. This is going to be a shared living room room over the next two days and make sure you take your empty coffee cups and bottles outside uh, so we can all enjoy two wonderful days. So the headsets are arriving. Thank you very much, Konstantin. Testing, testing. There's a sound check for the English channel. If you can hear this, you're tuned into the English channel. Okay, on that note, a very warm welcome. Thanks for joining us. It's an untimely hour for a Saturday morning. Can you hear me? Does the translation work? Can you hear me? Okay, so you hear, you're listening to the English translation, okay? The panelists can hear me. Okay, let's kick off. And um, we are going to discuss the weight of a bit. So we're going to talk about the social and environmental impacts of uh, digitalization. So um, we can uh, decouple growth on the one hand and uh, the social and environmental costs on the other hand. 
question mark is there a an automatic decoupling i.e. intangible products don't need any matter they don't need any physical substance or to put it differently apps don't create any waste let me start with an anecdote i was at a landfill site recently but that wasn't a regular landfill site that landfill site is based in Accra, ghana and it's maybe the size of hyde park or tear garden just outside our doorstep this is where the largest part of us mobile phones and computer ends up the most impressive images 15 year old guys um, poke fume, dark fumes where they burn cables and play, play uh, boards in order to re uh, extract the metals. The environmental, social and physical uh, consequences are huge. And this film, which is currently being aired, um, is called Welcome to Sodom. And that's no coincidence that it's got this title. The closed loop economy works, but it works in different uh, circles as usually we would imagine. But first of all, I would like to introduce the panelists. First of all, Jenny Khan. Jenny Khan is a sociologist at the Polytechnical University of Hong Kong. And she is a consultant to ZACOM. ZACOM is an organization based in Hong Kong which looks at the interests of Chinese workers and migrants. And um, she's going to tell us about the labor conditions in the electronic industry in Asia. Very well, welcome. Then, Claude. Babemba, he's the director of uh, South Africa Research Watch, and uh, Claude looks at the implications of the nat exploitation of natural resources in Africa. Very well, welcome, Claude. Sabine Lankau. She is a scientist as at the Fraunhofer Institute for System Re Research in Karlsruhe think tank, and she has worked on a survey on the commodity re uh, requirements of the German high tech industry. Very warm welcome. Johanna Pohl, environmental engineer at the Technical University of Berlin, involved including but not limited to the project uh, digitalization and social and environmental transformation. She is going to tell us about the energy consumption of the Internet. Very warm welcome. And Simon Hinterholzer, he's an engineer for renewable energies at the Institute Border Step in Berlin. So he's very familiar familiar when it comes to green IT, environmentally friendly information technology, and he would tell, give us a lowdown on that subject. Very well, welcome. My name is Hannes Koch. Uh, I'm a journalist and correspondent for a couple of dailies, uh, including but not limited the TATS, left-wing newspaper in Berlin. And let's adopt the following approach. So this will take about 90 minutes until half past one. So first of all, we'll have two brief keynote, uh, keynote uh, rounds uh, on stage, um, like input statements uh, here on the panel, and then you, the floor, the audience have the floor to put your questions. Please go to the microphone, request the floor, allows me to pick you in sequence and um, then afterwards there will be a brief wrap-up round over the next 90 minutes. So without much further ado, let's get started. Jenny, question to you. You are familiar with the working conditions in the electronic industry in Asia. You work uh, from your base in Hong Kong, and you're also very knowledgeable when it comes to a decisive case which created um, newspaper headlines with regard to the working conditions in the mobile phone and computer um, factories, so the buzzword being Foxconn. Please tell us about the Foxconn case and what happened a couple of years ago with the Apple suppliers. It, you just can start. Yeah, right. it, it will work. Testing. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, uh, good morning. My name is Jenny, and uh, thank you so much for the organizers. I'm so glad to be here. And I just fly from Hong Kong to join the two days conference. This is such a great opportunity for me to share about the labor conditions in China, and particularly on Foxconn. Uh, Foxconn, or Foxconn Technology Group, which is a Taiwanese company, at one time, it has more than 1.3 million workers around the world, but most of them are actually based in China. 1.3 million, which is actually equivalent to the whole population of Estonia, a small European country, as you know. So the size of the workforce is huge, but no one actually know much about Foxconn before 2010, when the 18 suicides happened, 14 of those 18 young workers died from jumping from the buildings. So what made them to take such a desperate action? Four survived but have crippling injuries like paralyzed uh, from the race down. So it's a really tragic uh, incident. I, at that time, was still doing my PhD at the London University. Um, I had never anticipated that I would do a dissertation on Foxconn neighbor. Foxconn is the largest uh, supplier to Apple, but it actually also produces our smartphones or tablets and printers, computers from all over the world, like Sony, HP, Dell, Samsung, Microsoft, Google, whichever brand names that are uh, we are of the fans. You know, at that time, I think most of us are very familiar with the consumer big name like Apple or HP, but we had never really heard about Foxconn. However, Foxconn is actually the world's largest electronics supplier. Uh, it was from that moment onward, I want to understand what had driven these young people to become such hopeless persons who prefer even to kill themselves rather than living on. So about nine to uh, ten years now almost, we have been uh, talking to Apple CEO, then Steve Jobs, and nowadays Tim Cook, and we have been also discussing with the conditions of uh, Foxconn, the key executives as well as the Apple faculty. Um, there is an Apple University and they have a team of social scientists who want to to figure out what are their supply chain problems, how to enhance labor and environmental uh, responsibility issues. But time and again, we see that this is a really sticky problem even though there's no more suicide, but in fact, strikes and protests and other abuses, like the abuse of student interns, uh, that have been recurrently happening in Foxconn. Jenny, sagen Sie uns mal bitte ganz genau. Jenny, could you just tell us about the problems? Why did people kill themselves? Why did they jump from the buildings? Was it wages? Why did they kill themselves? Was it wages? Was it wages? Maybe you could give us the details. Why did the young people kill themselves, jump from the buildings? Was it about wages? Was it about excessive working hours? What was the reason? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the excellent questions. Yeah, we will be more interactive. <laughs> and I would love to hear your questions as well. Um, I have been doing undercover research, so I pretend myself as one of the Foxconn workers. Yeah, I'm a bit older than them, but still putting on the blue jeans and putting on the uniforms, borrowing their staff card. I did get into the dormitories and also walk along the shop floor, because at that time, in some new factories, the electronics gates, the electronics uh, security system is not yet in place. So time and again, there have been some undercover research, interviews, and other materials that we gather, including their wage statements. Basically, Foxconn had been paying at the minimum level until May 2010. Only after the public uh, scandal and the uh, massive pressure from China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and also Germany and other parts of the world, then Foxconn raised a bit 
the minimum wage from the 1st of June 2010 onward. So you are right, if we have been talking about Foxconn as the world's largest electronics maker, and they are paying at the legal minimum. <laughs> that was not an illegal case, but it is such a low standard that workers have pushed themselves to do overtime and overtime all months during the time when we cannot wait for our iPhone, our iPhone 10 last year. We don't want to wait. And this kind of consumer pressure also drive Apple to push their suppliers so hard. So we are understanding the situation as a buyer-driven production chain. This is a buyer-driven production network where Apple, Dell, and HP, they all try to push their suppliers uh, on the what we call just-in-time production system. No more stocks or spares that you will just put them into a warehouse because it will just waste some money and time. Uh, so the pressure is not just about wage because workers also have to rent their apartment in the housing market, but the housing prices, just like in Berlin, <laughs> that have been going all up sky. It is difficult. The government has been turning a blind eye to the problem, so wage pressure to work more time to, to just make a little bit more money and without the freedom of association rights, there's no union that they can independently or democratically organize. And even at this moment, when I'm uh, talking with you, there have been another case that is in China, in the southern part of China, which is not Foxconn, but it is also another technology company where workers want to unionize according to the trade union law, but those workers have been detained, and the student supporters nowadays are being caught by the secret police or by the party state. So I am here actually to talk about Foxconn and some other cases, and uh, we will have other time for other speakers, so I will stop right here. And leave it Okay. Also, it is a bundle of. Okay, so if I understand you correctly, it's a raft of different uh, reasons. Wage, uh, excessive working hours, um, no holidays, maybe this is part of the explanation. Maybe, did things change in recent years, ever since it created an international headlines and uh, ever since it also made a difference for buyers of Apple uh, devices here in Germany? So did things change? Did Apple and Foxconn improve working conditions since 2010? Hi. Uh, because it's very loud, I will hear myself. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, from 2010, then I did literally hundreds of interviews, and there were also many uh, of my colleagues, teachers, and activists. We have been doing interviews, doing survey, and talking to executives, uh, journalists, and students, and professors. And in 2014, I graduated from London University. I have been teaching for two years in Oxford before I'm moving back home in Hong Kong, where now I'm teaching at the Hong Kong. Company Technic University. I had never imagined that this project would take so long. <laughs> yeah, really almost like a decade. I've never anticipated that. Um, and one reason, in fact, is because the difficulties to move even one step forward is so difficult. Despite the fact that Apple had improved a lot in terms of disclosing its supplier list, Back in 2010, there's no any supplier list. You don't even know the names and locations of the key suppliers of Apple. But in 2011, they did make it transparent and open. So you and I could actually just uh, take a look at those lists and locate the key suppliers. 
There have been also some uh, so-called improvements in terms of how Apple sourced their materials from Congo or from other mines. So environmental issues, yes. They also hire really top-ranking persons from environmental agency to join Apple. So there have been some improvements as they put in their annual report. But I have to emphasize that labor issues seems to be much more sticky and difficult. Even nowadays, we do know there have been teenagers who are from vocational schools, and they are not like you and I today. We have our freedom to choose to come here and join this panel. But they must be working like 12 hours a day to put together our iPhones and iPads. The students, they do not have the choice. Because if they do not do so-called the internship, they cannot graduate. This is a big collusion among the vocational schools, the local governments, which like Foxconn to invest, to improve economic conditions, and then Apple also benefit from the supply chain. So I just want to really emphasize that in terms of labor issues, we have been observing the problem of higher manufacturing wages in China, but at the same time, student interns are not legally defined as employees. And therefore, these are the cheaper labor force that could be helpful whenever Apple push is a uh, uh, demand for iPhones or the MacBook Air so much. Vielen Dank. Claude Gambemba, lassen Sie uns kommen zu den äh, ökologischen Bedingungen. Claude Gambemba, let us now talk about the ecological and working conditions of uh, raw materials production in Africa. Can you tell us? something about the environmental conditions. How about the uh, mines in Congo? Uh, what are the working and environmental conditions there? Thank, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, and uh, I think Jenny has highlighted to the importance of uh, the electronics which are being produced in very bad human conditions in China. But those electronics need uh, raw materials. And uh, some of the, those raw materials comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And uh, some of them are coltan, it, and gold. These are very important uh, materials for electronics, even for aerospace and computers. Now, the area where these materials are extracted in the Democratic Republic of Congo has experienced war for the, since 1998 at the peak of the commodity price of coltan from 1998 to 2003. That war which was resource around the resources was termed the first African World War. It was a war of control of resources, which saw Congolese neighbors intervening and which saw an increase of, explo of export of coltan and world's family and gold. Now, you have to understand the condition in which this resource is extracted. There are no mining companies, formal industrial mining companies, that extract coltan. But gold you have. You have industrial and you have artisanal mining in gold. But there is no industrial mining that extracts coltan, which is a key mineral in electronics such as uh, and in uh, uh, and in uh, in cell phones the conditions of extraction are condition of insecurity up to date you have rebel movement and militias that continue to operate in that part of the the country 
and sometimes taking over the exploitation of these minerals. But then, it's a country that has serious governance challenges. That part of the country, the government has no capacity to control it because it's under a very serious insecurity. Also, we have the problem of governance across the Congo itself. So the condition of work is that because of unemployment in the country, most people find ease to go and extract these minerals. So you'll find men and women and children working in hard conditions with no techniques or materials, uh, equipment and clothes that will allow them to work in good conditions. So the conditions are hard. It's a condition of armed groups roaming around the entire place. It's conditions of labor, uh, child labor. It's conditions of uh, environmental uh, degradation because this uh, artisanal mining does affect uh, the land, does cut trees, and the entire condition of sanitation is deplorable because there's no access to health system. There's no access to sanitation. And you find vulnerable people like pregnant women closer to these mines which have serious environmental impact. So the conditions are quite uh, uh, difficult to work in. Can you can you tell us how many people live in those uh, uh, small mines? How much do they earn per month? Can a family make a living based on the labor in those mines? In, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, you have closer to 2 million artisanal miners. Uh, 100,000 work in an, a province where they extract cobalt which is now going into electrical cars. It's another debate. But uh, in the place where we have coal town and gold, we have close to 1.5 million workers in artisanal mining. The working, because they depend, they don't sell directly to the international market, they sell to uh, other people who then take those products to outside the country, they are robbed of their hard work. The work they invest in digging these minerals does not correspond with the salaries of the fee they get for those minerals. When you talk to them and the times we've spoken to them, they don't get enough. In fact, if you've seen them 10 years ago, you go today to, to visit the same mining workers, you'll find that their condition has not changed uh, an inch. In fact, most of the time what you've realized is that women who have remained at home, who do agriculture, uh, support the family better than the men that have gone to do uh, artisanal mining because it's a more of a survival activities. It's a day-to-day -day, uh, uh, activities. But even when they get a bit of money, the financial management of that money is not there. So they misuse it. So, so, so most of the time, really, the hard work that is put in and the, the revenue that they collect, there is a very strong uh, uh, gap. Uh, normally, when you calculate, uh, for them to eat they, they spend all their little money they get on food that is exported. People who make money from these miners are people who bring food to them, clothes, alcohol, and so on. And those who sell to them the instrument they use to dig these minerals. In fact, they spend all their money around the area where they dig these minerals and little goes to their families back home. So there is really, it's a, it's a continuation of poverty. The artisanal mining in this area is not transformative of society. So what we are looking at is hope for a better future, but hope that will not come in the current conditions.
Vielen Dank. Frau Lankau, wir Thank you very much, Mrs. Lankau. We now heard about exploitation conditions for resources, raw materials in Africa. You have conducted a study, and there you have investigated the uh, need for raw materials in the German high-tech industry sector. Can you please outline the results of your study? Does German industry need more or less resources, and what do you think will be the development for these strategic industries and their materials requirement? And when we talk about uh, digital industries, internet, and so on, what is their material requirement? I hope you can hear me. We have not the best acoustic conditions on stage. Our study is called Raw Materials for Future Technologies. What do we mean when we say future technologies? Technologies are, that are just relatively new but are very promising for the future. We look at those uh, future technologies and try to carry out a plausible assessment how much raw materials these technologies will need in the future. And why is that interesting? First of all, the study is sponsored by the German Agency for Raw Materials. Their task is to make sure German industry has enough raw materials. And so this uh, agency is interested in a forecast about the future need for materials. Of course, it's a question that is also interesting for our panel because uh, when we have more and more demand for those raw materials, uh, we will have more ecological and social problems, and these problems will be relevant, especially regarding ecological problems. One can say they are going to grow as the demand goes up, and we don't think that uh, efficiency increases, efficiency improvement will maybe cushion somewhat the environmental problem, but still over and above they're going to go up. As far as social conditions are concerned, it all depends on the individual decisions of the actors, the industrial actors. But as far as environmental conditions are concerned, they cannot improve significantly. <clears throat> Let's take an overall look of the need for raw materials, the demand for raw materials. It's growing on global scale. More and more companies need raw materials for various reasons. We have a growing um, world population. On average, we also have an increase in prosperity. On average, people get richer, and that will mean that the global economy is going to grow. And as it grows, there will be a more demand for raw materials. Over the last 20 years, we have seen that uh, the demand for iron, for instance, has tripled. Of course, uh, efficient technologies could be used to sort of mitigate that effect, and we also see that as the economy grows, there is more and more demand for services. But we do not have a complete and absolute decoupling between raw materials demand and global economy. What do we have in terms of future technologies? We looked at different types of raw materials and which are the ones that are especially important for the so-called future technologies. And we've seen there are five materials where we expect a major demand in growth based on future technologies. Tantal, scandium, cobalt, the lights, raw, uh, re rare earth, and gem germanium. And they are three more metals where we see an even more significant growth impulse. Heavy rare earth, lithium, and rhenium. Thank you. Raw, that was raw materials. Let's now talk about electricity, energy in general. Mrs. Poole, there are horror scenarios saying that uh, modern technologies use up too much energy. Like, for instance, the Bitcoin currency currently needs as much energy as the whole of Denmark. If things go on like that, and at that rate, we will need more and more power plants in order to provide electricity to all these industries. 
How about uh, power consumption of the internet and modern technologies? Do you think we are going to have a constantly growing demand for electricity? Super question. It's my favorite one. I can add two more countries to Denmark. But let's talk about the status quo. Tim Santarians, in his introductory lecture before, already gave some information on that. As far as the power demand in digitization is concerned, is 10% of the overall global electricity com consumption. Those 10% of global electricity are needed for computing centers and cables. So if the Internet were a country, it would have the third largest demand for electricity after China and the U.S. That is a lot. It's even bigger than Russia. And uh, Tim has also shown a graph saying that uh, we are going to have a global growth in energy demand. Not only 10% will be required in 20, 30 or 40, even much more. Much depends on the number of uh, other questions like uh, the future of digitization and the general demand for electricity. 10% of the overall electricity much just for ICT, it is a lot and it is the third largest uh, factor after China and the US. That was the brief information I wanted to give. Mr. Hinterholz, and now over to you. You deal with green IT. What is that? First of all, good morning to you, and thanks for organizing this conference. It's wonderful for me to be here. Now, let me say what is green IT. The green IT approach is based on the environmental impact of information and communication technologies, ICT. Like Johanna said, 10% of the global energy consumption go into ECT. For green ICT, that means we can and must design our IT resources in an energy efficient way, and we must also create conditions so that ICT can contribute to saving of electricity and raw materials. Uh, this is another approach usually called green by ICT. They are classical examples, like for instance uh, heating control devices that lower heating levels when you're not at home. In this area, we also have a lot of visions, sometimes speculations. In the 90s, they all talked about the vision of having a paperless office where you need no longer any printed material because you do everything via computer, internet. And you would no longer write letters because you've got your PC at home. But then we found uh, that this never happened. Ever since the 90s, our paper consumption has doubled globally. Similar things happened regarding business trip. Uh, theoretically, one could replace them by Skype meetings, online meetings. You would think there's a huge potential to avoid the CO2 emissions of air traffic. But it turned out it didn't happen. Indeed, business trips in spite of all the digitization that we have seen for a couple of decades already, in spite of all that, the number of business trips has increased. And we could not reduce it on the basis of ICT. Now, computer and the Internet, of course, need uh, electricity, consume electricity. Is there hope or is there even an example showing that ICT in other areas save more energy than they consume. Is that realistic or is that not realistic at all? It is realistic. We always talk about the dematerialization and the decoupling and ICT itself is a technology that is developing 
constantly. The energy consumption of ICT is decreasing by 50% every 18 months. That is to say, the chips that I'm using can be replaced after 18 months with the, sa uh, with the same chips uh, that can save 50% can save energy. Savings effects are possible, but most of the time people don't look at that. They just want to increase the performance. Like, for instance, TVs get more and more uh, precise, and so all the savings we can achieve on the basis of efficiency are wasted because we have higher performance rates. There are a number of savings potentials for ICT. The best example is uh, the control of your heating back home. I already talked about that. When you're not home, your heating can be re reduced, and uh, that could be self-learning devices, knowing exactly when you are going to be back home, and they would uh, ramp up the heating before you get home so you are not entering into a cold apartment. There are other examples like the fridge or lights that adjust to the ambient light, and that will bring about savings potentials. But we also have to be a bit critical as far as this saving is concerned, because the integration of electronics and ICT in all kinds of domestic devices also leads to additional consumption, because these devices must continuously be available, addressable on the basis of uh, the Internet, and that leads to a standby energy consumption, 3 watt per device. In the long run, we, we are going to have 20 or 30 network devices. That means uh, the consumption is relevant as far as overall energy consumption is concerned. Zur Frage, ähm, also Stromverbrauch, Energieverbrauch insgesamt. Seit den Anfang der 90er, äh, Anfang der 1990er Jahre ist es in Deutschland so, dass sich Wachstum, also Wirtschaftswachstum und ähm, Primärenergieverbrauch entkoppelt haben, also mindestens relativ entkoppelt haben. Das Wachstum ist gestiegen. Der the decoupling divide, um, so question to you. Ever since the 1990s, we saw a decoupling, so the energy consumption didn't increase simultaneously. It even went down slightly ever since 2016. So at that point, there is a slight decoupling of economic growth and energy consumption in Germany. So question to you. Um, do you think it's possible that this trend might continue under the conditions of digitalization, i.e. an increase in power consumption through digitalization, through more digital terminal devices and more ICT? So will that trend, that declining energy consumption continue, or do we have to be concerned that on aggregate the power energy consumption of our industry might increase again in the wake of digitalization? So first of all, let me mention this, that I'm not an an economist by background, but decoupling. When it comes to digitalization, or what I can deserve, uh, observe here is uh, the topic of hope. Everybody hopes that digitalization will resolve climate change. Digitalization will allow us de decoupling. Uh, buzzword of green growth is something that is always bandied around by politicians and many companies when it comes to the digital ag agenda of the co German government. They say, okay, digitalization will help us um, resolve of the issue of climate change. I mean, that's a lofty ambition, but there are no, there's no pro proof that this actually works. One of the reasons that we look at is, uh, as, as the research group, is commodity requirements for, with regard to digitalization, energy or power consumption of digitalization. So unfortunately, that's a, a black box, and that's to do with what Simon said. Uh, digital devices, sensors, setup, uh, Wi-Fi, etc. 
So um, here we are talking about Industry 4.0. We try to switch entire production chains to digitization. So in terms of monitoring, it's very difficult to see where digitization eats up resources. But I think it's rather ICT. We should uh, replace digitization through ICT. So where do we get power consumption due to ICT? And what is the savings potential that we can attribute, once again, to digitization? So one of the aspects which definitely Definitely is a strong argument against a decoupling are rebound effects. All of these relative efficiency gains, which indeed um, can be seen in digital applications and ICT, are eaten up again by the so-called rebound effects because efficiency gains um, actually mean that they cannot be achieved uh, in the absolute implementation, maybe because you have additional consumption or other things will be uh, consumed on top of that. With regard to digitalization, that's very exciting. I spoke about the 10% uh, globe of global power consumption, which can be accrued, can be attributed to ICT. If you look at the root causes of power consumption, it's less to do with a mobile phone, which is uh, being charged at home or for the production of mobile phones, but power consumption at data centers and power consumption before the transport of data. So infrastructure and data centers are the key drivers when with regard to the power consumption of ICT. And if you look at what's being done in data centers, IP traffic, what are the kind of information that being transported from A to B and which uh, create that power consumption? Is it industry? Is it smart home systems? Then you come across, uh, so if you put that question, you come across across a very interesting answer. It's Netflix, it's YouTube, it's YouPorn, lots of streams which account for at least 50 to 75 percent of global IP traffic. And that, in turn, drives up the ICT power consumption to at least 10 percent globally. So basically, it's to do with us sitting at home watching Netflix and YouTube. We are the main culprits of the increasing power consumption of ICT and di digitization. And maybe the smart home system, which helps us save resources, don't really really eat up that much power. Show of hands, who doesn't do any film streaming, streaming or you know TV on demand at home? So it's a minority. It's a you know negligible minority. So let's get back to the topic of commodity, Mr. Tanga. Um, you spoke about rare earths and uh, the increasing demand. So rare earths uh, particularly are the drivers of e-mobility, electric cars and e-mobility is praised, is sold to us as environmentally green solution, as something that is benign for the environment, use, uh, helpful transport solution. Is that a valid proposition based or, uh, or, or in view of increasing commodity requirements with regard to certain men? metals and what about the eco environmental footprint of e-mobility okay depends where you're coming from when you look at that topic or when you try to answer that question if you say the biggest environmental challenge of our day and age is climate change and if you take it that uh, electric cars will all be fueled by green power, power from renewable sources, then you may say that e-mobility is part of the equation. If you want to improve inner urban air quality, e-mobility may partly resolve the issue at hand. But if you compare e-car electric vehicles with conventional cars through from cradle to grave, so both for, for cars, both for fuels, if you look at the uh, commodity mining production and disposal, then you come to the conclusion that e-mobility in some environmental categories don't perform that well. So sometimes they're better, sometimes they're less favorable than conventional cars. For instance, that applies to the category of human toxicity, for instance, of the entire life cycle. The uh, e electric vehicles produce more toxic substances, which are also harmful to human beings. This also applies to acidification, like um, acid rain. I mean, that's no longer such a big problem in Germany, but also in, uh, in other parts of the world it is. So in terms of acid rain, you have more noxious substances 
is uh, produced from electric vehicles of the life cycle. So therefore, I would not necessarily uh, answer in the affirmative when you ask me whether it's a green technology. And if you look at the overall system effects, as soon as you turn around to people and say, oh, we've got the problem and uh, the electric cars is the, is the solution to all your problems, then we don't need to question how the way in which we behave, our consumer patterns. If you say, OK, we've got a technical solution and we'll continue, electric mobility is going to resolve the issue, at that point, human beings stop to think about alternative solutions. And that means that electric cars are actually in the way of uh, the actual solution. The actual solution can just be uh, come in the form of changed infrastructure and uh, changed transportation behavior. So, Mr. Kabemba, what about the origins of the resources, rare earths, for instance, in Africa? I mean, there were some attempts to regulate that matter in order to avoid or, or prevent the conditions of exploitation of these resources. There was a legislation in the US and there are certain regulatory attempts at par as part of the European Union. Now, what about these regulatory attempts? Did they help in recent years improve the situation of the social and environmental conditions in, in Congo? Uh, we we've had uh, the international community trying to solve the problem of uh, conflict minerals and minerals that are getting on the international market through illicit uh, 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 trajectories. We've had effort with the OECD guidelines, which uh, really did a little uh, not much to help uh, uh, break the, this exploitation of illegal uh, and conflict minerals and uh, their environmental impact because it continued. Then we had uh, the Dot Frank, uh, which uh, was uh, initiated in the United States, which is a United States legislation. Uh, then we have in the EU, the European, the EU directives, which also want to force European companies to report project by project on where they source their materials and the condition within which they source those materials. These are very important initiatives, but uh, they are also very much very voluntary uh, and sanction which are applied outside the country of origin of these resources. Now, I want to argue that uh, we need to distinguish between the regime of responsibility and the regime of constraints. The regime of constraints which has been imposed on uh, the Great Lakes region, on the Democratic Republic of Congo, to say uh, which are foreign, might not work without the regime of responsibility. I think the regime of responsibility is far more important where a state is capable to put in place mechanisms, le legislation and policies that is also able to implement. Without this regime of responsibility, it's very difficult for this external legislation to work in an empty way the state is weak. Now, to respond if they've worked or not, I think when you look at the dot franc, it had a, a psychological impact to create environment space for new initiative, for certification to take place. Today, we have a series of certification mechanisms that try to, to, to certify minerals that are coming from the Great Lakes region, including the Democratic Republic of Congo. But the problem of this certification, they rely on information provided by companies. You cannot have companies monitoring themselves. Most of the report of these companies sounds, seems to be a copycat. It's something that they produce themselves and we rely on those information because you have something like 300 mines in the Democratic Republic of Congo that you need to monitor. These mines are far-fetched from the cities, 
Sometimes you need to walk, to walk 50, 60 kilometers because there's no access, road access. So there is no manpower to ensure that uh, these certification are correct. So what we've seen and uh, the, the information we are getting from the ground, from colleagues, from communities is that these mechanisms have not really helped the Congolese people. A mechanism that is applied not to take people out of poverty, a mechanism that is applied not to afford people the opportunity to benefit from their resources, is not a mechanism that is resolving the problem. And in most of these cases, these mechanisms are not, have not built in so the issue of society. They've also not built in the issue of environmental impact. Now, we've, since we are in Germany, we are in Europe, if we have to ask a question, will the European directive change that scenario? We know that the Dodd-Frank has been almost uh, stopped by, uh, by the, uh, the President Donald Trump. It's not, it means that because of the competition to access these uh, raw materials, this rare earth, these uh, strategic minerals by companies, they also lobby government. And government, because of fossil competition, European government are also uh, lobbying. We know that Germany has got serious difficult uh, position on some of the EU directive, which do not go in the way of uh, ensuring that directive are implemented in a transparent, accountable manner. So we, I think there is a, the lack of implementation of effectiveness has to do with uh, the political willingness in Europe, but also Europe have to understand in a country like the Democratic Republic of Congo, where there's no state, where the government is weak, where there's corruption, you cannot depend on this foreign initiative to resolve the problem of uh, illicit financial, uh, illicit uh, extraction uh, and uh, conflict minerals. You need to help the Congo to build a state, a state that is effective, that it can implement its own laws and the legislation. Wenn es jetzt Anregung okay, thank you very much for this uh, round on the panel. Now the audience has the floor. If you have any comments, questions, observations, you have the floor. Please take the microphone here in the center. It will allow me to see you better. If there's any questions, feel free. But before we move on to the Q&A round, questions and answers. Question to Jenny from my part. Is there any progress in terms of the working conditions in the electronics industry in Asia? Um, uh, I heard there's a, an Apple cooperation with the Fair Labor Association. With re They want to increase wages, reduce working hours, etc. Did that work? Or is it just a toothless tiger? Has this imp made a change for the better in social conditions over the past 10 years? Hello. Yeah. Well, quite a surprising question about Fair Labor Association, FLA. <laughs> they have headquarters in, the, uh, in Washington, D.C., and they have branches in China as well. But FLA, well, it is a multi-stakeholder organization. They have civil society, universities, companies, um, and other groups. Apple was the first technology company which joined FLA in 2012 after series of suicides, explosions, fire, and death. Okay, so 2012 in January, February was the moment when Apple decided to join FLA and ask FLA to investigate three factories of Foxconn across China. Um, and then in 2016, FLA removed its membership from FLA. We don't know why Apple decided to, left, uh, decided to leave FLA. But anyway, being the FLA, 
FLA membership for four years, are there any significant changes? Um, not really in terms of labor issues. Again, FLA did uh, report some information and many newspapers and media report on that. But as soon as the pressure had lowered, uh, things seem to get back to business. The crucial missing gap here is actually workers. Workers do not have the space to join together in a union and monitor the conditions on a day-to-day -day basis. And Apple always have to compete with Samsung or other brands to be the world number one. These are the built-in pressure within the production chain. Samsung also record a number of cases in terms of leukemia, cancer, and other serious issues back in South Korea, as well as in other Asian countries, and not only China. So we do see the problem as a really um, more systematic, um, industry-wide issue. It is not just about Apple or Foxconn, but since they are the two biggest companies in the whole world, we can prioritize and think of how to mobilize consumers, students, academics, journalists to work together to really create some positive changes. Herzlichen Dank. So, eine Frage. Bitte sagen Sie, wer Sie Thank you very much. We have a question over there. Please uh, state your affiliation, who you are and to whom you direct your question. I have two questions. Kai from Karlsruhe is my name. So question concerning the commodities which are extracted under very difficult conditions. Can't you recycle the raw materials or is that not worthwhile or would we have to create incentives? And the second question, is optical fiber more uh, efficient than the data transmission through copper wires, which is very customary in Germany? Or qu first question, Ms. Langkauer, recycling, is that an option? Of course, in an ideal world, recycling would, wouldn't be an issue. But with regard to recycling, you always need to check whether recycling is really better than the primary is extraction. I mean, when it comes to cobalt, um, it's a different matter because it's also to do with the HR issue and at least you don't exacerbate the situation further or compound the situation further. But the thing is, if we don't source any cobalt from Congo, we need to ask ourselves, have you really resolved the issues which re exist in Congo? That's a different question. But let's assume that recycling could be part of the answer. Then it's also a technical cost, uh, question or an economical question. Efficiency question. Technically, it's possible to recycle it, but uh, the problem is uh, collecting the materials. So in the ICT products, uh, you have small cobalt volumes, which you need to recycle and collect back from consumers. And the problem is that more than 50% of the, commodi of the uh, commodities are not returned for recycling purposes. So they get lost. About 50% of the tech products get lost. And then that's a problem if you've got small quantities in these technical devices for private consumers, um, consumer entertainment. So it's very difficult to extract it again and to sort it. So the key problem and key stumb uh, bottleneck is that it's not worth the while of recycling companies. So there's no business case. OK, you may offset this problem through deposit sy systems. At least it allows you to collect more than 50%. But you need to let, take a look at it globally and not just in Germany. In Germany, where deposit schemes work fairly well. And then, of course, uh, if there is no an economic incentives, uh, then you need to ask yourselves how you can uh, create the economic incentives through legislation. And the second question went more towards the energy um, balance of optical fiber or copper. Maybe Mr. Hinterholzer can answer the question, what is the better technology, optical fiber or copper wires or cables? Well, I'm not an expert with regard to commodities, but copper tends to be a commodity which is also difficult to extract. And um, the material uh, cost for optical fiber lines is much lower. I mean, optical fiber in terms of the data transfer rate 
is much better than several copper uh, lines, which would have to be connected in in, uh, in parallel. So. I mean, the performance is higher of optical fibers. It can replace lots of copper lines. You have higher bandwidths. Allow me to add a few things. I think in our digi digitalization debate, we are noticing step by step that efficiency cannot be a panacea. Efficiency can uh, reduce power consumption, but the rebound effects will bring about an increase in power consumption, let me come back to Simon's example. Television sets become bigger, the uh, transmission rates uh, for images get uh, higher. And if I have an HD television and if I can have a smart screen and even a better image, I can have a better film experience and that is why data transmission rates are going to grow exponentially which means again higher power consumption and so we have the big issue can we really use efficiency no we can't we can change a number of small things but we also have to have the overall system in mind and that is why our research group for uh, ecological transformation we are talking about these issues because we think we need a definition of how many resources do we need to guarantee an equitable life for all people on Earth. So we have to think in terms of our whole planet. Before the next person takes the floor, Claude Kabemba wanted to say something about recycling. Look, I think uh, the overconsumption is a problem which increases over extraction of these minerals. Now, recycling might be an option. And uh, I get the sense that Japan has made recycling an important uh, aspect of uh, its uh, consumption. Is, uh, there seems to, there's a slogan which they put that we've found gold in computers and electronic recycling. So if there is a commitment from a government uh, that they can force uh, some companies to recycle some of the existence material we have, because as we extract, we use them, it means this material we extracted remain on earth. We have them in this, uh, in this product, but it's a commitment. The difficulties to collect them is a problem, but it's more of a lack of policy lack of commitment and sanctions for those who misuse this electronic and uh, throw them in the environment. But I think we also need to, to educate consumers that uh, there's just enough consumption you can have. The competition among these electronic companies does provide space for increasing co consumerism. And I think we need to look into that. Uh, the competition to have a new self, to have a new type of cell phone, a performing cell phone with uh, games and so on, does uh, does uh, 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 increase the consumption thing. So I think we need as people to look into our uh, consumption and see how we can educate. And education has to start with our young people in schools. Thank you. Bitte jetzt sind Sie dran. Now you have the floor. Thank you. I'm Christian Germani from DNR. I've got a question to Mrs. Cheng. The problems that you have described, are they specific only for the electronic industry? I remember a study that said that the electronic industry is working hard on improving the conditions much more than other sectors of industry. Maybe that is uh, because the global public has focused on the conditions in the electronics industry. So they are doing more than, say, for instance, the automotive industry, the uh, toys industry, and they are not so active when it comes to improving working conditions. Can you really say the electronics people are doing more? Uh, 
Well, thank you so much. Your question is really insightful because you are taking a comparative perspective. You are asking me is that the electronics industry are doing much better than, let's say, automobile industry, toys, garment, or other industry. I would only say that they did get lots of attention because every one of us, when I fly from Hong Kong to Germany on the flight, everyone is looking at their tablet or a mobile phone or movie, chatting with their loved ones, and I'm also talking to my mom since I just came here. Well, we rely on these electronics device, and even from a kid to those who are above 80 years old, we depend so much on these portable high-tech electronics device in our daily life, in education, entertainment, uh, leisure, and so on. I will figure out why journalists will have immense interest in electronics companies, especially like Apple or Foxconn, Sony, and so on. Well, the civil society groups in this sense also develop rapidly. We have Electronics Watch who also organize a workshop at 3 p.m. today here. And we got Good Electronics where I had also joined as the steering group members since its existence in 2006. Well, there have been lots of momentums and dynamics here. So as the corporate uh, business group, they have had joint forces to form an EICC, Electronics Industry Citizenship Coalition, now becomes RBA, Responsible uh, Business Alliances. Given I said that there are many different groups that are working so-called together to make a change, but we all have to be sensitive to the fact that these company people, they join together to also protect themselves from criticisms. And if they are really serious on making changes, first of all, they have to let us know what is the pricing. How much do they actually pay Foxconn? And then Foxconn, the boss, will be willing to pay for its workers. There are so many different layers or um, different uh, levels that involve uh, buyers and contractors and subcontractors in the really long supply chain. Uh, these problems are there and um, the, the problems might be only getting worse given the fact that we depend so much on these lovable electronics items. Uh, the great speakers had talked about the use of red earth uh, cobalt or other materials like tin and, and other raw materials, and they have been dug out sometimes by child laborers. If we have been talking about using the wind, sun, water, solar energy to produce all these items, it is both a reality and an illusion. So I just uh, try to wrap up here that the problems are really complicated. Thank you. We have another question. We have another person who wants to take the floor. Um, ETC group, etc. Group. Um, each of the panelists has been asked to speak about a part of the problem, and but by your comments as panelists, you've all made it clear that you understand a much wider range of issues and even speak to each other's areas of concern, which I, I thank you for. Um, but somehow still, when we look at the solutions to these parts, we end up with a solution for one part that doesn't help the other parts or even can make it worse for other parts of the problem. And the technology we're dealing with cuts across the world, the entire economy of the world, it cuts across every industrial sector. So how do we put a circle around the whole thing? How do we find a way to use your talents and our concerns to address technology assessments, to look at a way of, of understanding it all and say as civil society, as, as, as can there be a level of citizen assessment of technologies that can be pressure on governments to have a, a, a wide vision of the whole technology together in one place. Dealing with the parts kind of drives me crazy after a while. Somehow we need to deal with the whole thing and find a way of assessing technologies. I wonder if you could comment on that. Thank you. Ja, vielen Dank. Das ist, ähm 
Thank you very much. I think that is the crucial question. That's the crucial all um, question to all our panelists. We still have 15 minutes to go before our break, and I suggest that we will hear one more comment or question. There's somebody who wants to say something, and then we are going to uh, sum up and try to find the answers to the big question that was just raised. I'm Michael Fellner. I come from the Austrian Digitization Agency. I've got a small question. Not about the very big things, but the very small things. Uh, I mean, we are Austria. Uh, we have many SMEs who have to cope with digitalization. And we want those industries also to make a good contribution. What am I going to tell my small and medium-sized uh, enterprises? I'm a business consultant, and how can I make sure that my consultancy contributes to their digitizing their work in a sustainable way? Is there anybody who has an answer to that? Can I answer the overall question? I'm not so sure, but one thing. You know, in your question, there was an important aspect, namely the link between digitalization and sustainability. Digitalization can have an effect both ways, and digitalization has an impact on sustainability because of the resources and electricity requirements. But we can use digitization also for sustainable purposes can improve situation. That's very important as an aspect. Sustainability must be introduced in the debate. Yesterday I read that DBU published a an opinion poll, poll among citizens about digitization and sustainability and how they see these things. Most people said digitalization. I never saw it in the context of sustainability, and I think that is something we need to have in mind, especially when we talk to small and medium-sized enterprises. Let them think about um, digitalization as sustainability. Maybe I will try to give a pragmatic answer. Digitalization in small and medium-sized companies has something to do with setting up a management system that uses the digital opportunities. And I think here you can always combine that with an environmental management, an energy management, and a supply chain, supply chain management that takes into account social and ecological considerations. Now, coming to the big question at the end of this panel. Oftentimes, we heard skeptical remarks, whether digitalization can make a contribution to sustainability at all, and whether digitalization can really improve working conditions. What could be a solution here? If digitalization is just a technical solution, yet another technology that will produce the same old problems that our other technologies have produced. How can we go beyond that level? How can What can we use? Being more efficient, the efficiency gains that we can, can get, uh, is that the most important thing? Yes, I think the big solution will consist of many small aspects. I don't think there is one simple big solution fit for all purposes. Let me mention three aspects. Technical solutions are always interesting because they can be easily implemented. Behavioral changes are much more difficult to bring about. And that is why I think we will have to invest into technical solutions and continue research. But I don't think this is the only thing we need to do. Of course, we need more responsibility of the manufacturers, the producers. 
when we look at the electronic products, they are also complex. Uh, you heard that over 50 different elements, uh, chemical elements, are used for such a product. It cannot be made the responsibility of the consumers to take a decision based on the overall value chain. It's not possible. The consumer can't see. Here, the responsibility must be on the manufacturers. They must be held liable for the effects they create along the value chain. Uh, Fair Magnets is one of uh, those projects. Um, these are manufacturers who try along their value chains to speak to their suppliers as equals and try to improve the situation on the ground. Of course, these are small steps, but small steps can eventually lead to a big solution. But at the end of the day, we are also going to need legislation. We need binding legisla legislation imposing obligations on the manufacturers uh, and creating a level playing field. So my two aspects is technical solution, manufacturer's liability, and thirdly, I also think we as consumers are responsible too. We have to think about reducing our ecological footprint and obviously, efficiency and reduction of consumption. We need to consume less. Once you start doing that, you would ask yourself personally, what do I really need? What improves my quality of life? Do I have to have a bigger TV set? It's a very individual que question, but once you've asked this question, you can start consuming less of the things that do not really improve your quality of life. And you can use the money you have saved and the time you've saved to invest into bringing about the changes you would like to see in the world. And again, when I say the big things need to change, it must be done in small steps. Mr. Kabemba, what do you think? People in Africa want more prosperity. They want to get out of poverty. And here you hear on stage that we are supposed to consume less and consume less of the uh, raw materials that are produced in Africa. Do you think that's a good strategy? And uh, what do you think about this slogan, sufficiency, more modesty? Is it a good solution? Thank you so much. It's a difficult question. Uh, let me just preface my intervention by saying if there is a continent that needs development, is the African continent. If there's a continent that needs to consume these resources, is the African continent. Because this is the continent where there's no infrastructure, where there's no electricity, where there's no clean water, but is uh, the victim of its abundance of resources which impact on its environment, increasing climate change, and uh, taking digitalization that is not produced on the continent. Now, responding to the bigger question and the question of development on the continent, I think, first of all, and first, first and foremost, we need to know that at each value chain point or phase, there are problems. We have problems on extraction of these raw materials. We have problems in transporting these raw materials. We have problems at value addition to these raw materials, and we have problems on fabricating these uh, electronics we use. They might differ, but the impact on human being, the impact on environment. Now, the response has to be a, 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 a conscientization of all key players who intervene at all those levels. And I want to think that the key stakeholder are governments because they initiate policies and legislation and implement them. 
and enforce them and sanction. We need to ensure that sanctions become part of resolving some of the environmental and human conditions that we see. But when you look at the world today, we have multiplicity of uh, guidelines and principles that must resolve the bigger question and the smaller questions. Now, this multiplicity of guidelines and principles and legislation does not help us because if we go to a company that produces raw material either in the Democratic Republic of Congo or fabricate electronics in Germany or use or in, in, in China with uh, five, ten different, differently guidelines and principles, global guidelines. They don't know which one to use. The global, the, the, the global reporting initiative, we've reflected very much on the difficulties of companies to be able to use the multiplicity of this global initiative that we have currently. So my suggestion is this one, is that we need to have binding global principles and initiatives. Right now, we don't have. We are trying to build the, the United Nations Human Rights and Business Guidelines. China, one of the biggest consumer and producer of electronics, is not part of some of the global regimes that came out of the Second World War, which govern the international community, and which are applied to govern some of the commitment and the behavior. So we might want, it's a proposition, we might want to revisit. I'm not saying they are bad, but we might want to put in place a system that is inclusive of all actors, new actors, because we are in a multipolar world today. Bring everybody, let's agree, on a global binding governance guidelines and principles. As, unless we have that, it will be difficult because everyone wants to promote his own principles and guidelines. It might not work and it will never work. The last point uh, is that we also need to f enforce the reporting mechanisms. The, what we'll call the sustain, I like the, sustain, the sustainability reporting, which is continuous. And for that to be effective, I think we might want to include ethic committees in all these companies, big and small. That will ensure that these companies are responsible, are transparent, and are accountable on their behavior, and that they can be sanctioned. But you also need to educate ourselves that we have the power to hold these companies to account by also sanctioning if they import, if they use materials that are coming from space that undermine human rights and that destroy the environment. But you have to know, the extraction of minerals will always pollute. But the question is, how do we mitigate that pollution? And how do we ensure that it has no adverse consequences on people? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. We have nearly reached the end, but not quite yet. We have already heard two answers. And in summary, one can say there must be a technical solution. That is to say, we have to work towards recycling, less use of natural resources. Here, digitalization can help. The second item that was mentioned um, by Mr. Kabemba, regulation, legislation, global regulation, that's also something very difficult. Mrs. Paul, my final question to you. We could now have a trinity, technical issues, uh, global regulation and sufficiency. Do you think that we as rich consumers uh, in the North can contribute by consuming less? I can definitely say you, yes. Since we talk about sustainability, sufficiency, 
is uh, a, an important component technology, legislation, uh, regulation, and sufficiency. That is what we need to have a sustainable life. Let me add one more item that is also related to your comments from the audience. Sabine Lankas has said we need to also understand that digitization is a tool and, uh, of course, reflects political and societal structures and power relationship. Digitization is a question of who makes the laws, who writes the software. So it's a reflection of power relationship. All these aspects must be taken into account uh, when carrying out a technology impact assessment. So we should not just simply look at how many resources do we need, how, uh, many, how much electricity do we need. We also have to take into account so structural, societal aspects. And there is a method for impact assessment. It's called technology impact assessment. An assessment uh, mechanism that was developed in Karlsruhe, and it includes these social questions. So we need a complete picture about the consequences of technology and where technology can be used pro in a profitable way for our benefit. We need such an assessment. Digitization uh, usually is thought in terms of dematerialization. And we have said that digitization is based on a material foundation and a human foundation. So and how do we think that in terms of dematerialization? I don't think that digitalization is dematerialized. The bits and the cloud, they have a weight. The cloud is not uh, weightless. It ha consumes electricity, human resources, and even human rights violations must be had in mind when talking about the cloud. So we have to discuss much more than before the question that digitization does not mean dematerialization. Thank you very much to all panelists here. Mrs. Chan, Mr. Kabemba, Mrs. Lankau, Mrs. Paul, Mr. Hinterholzer. Great discussion. I would like to thank you for listening and for being active in our discussion. We will stop here and I wish you a wonderful conference, a wonderful Congress.